You're listening to Halfway There, episode number 158, Laura Paget and Ambassadors of Joy. Hey friends, welcome to another episode of Halfway There. I am your host, Eric Nevins. Thank you so much for being here. This, of course, is the show where we have honest conversations with ordinary Christians about today's Christian experience. We really dive deep into what it's actually like to be a believer in Christ today, the ups and the downs, the sideways steps sometimes, and uh, the deserts and the mountains. So we, we talk about it all, and I hope that as we do, it's an inspiration to you uh, to, no matter what you're going through, I don't know what you're going through, um, but whatever it is, the Lord is there and he is working. Keep your eyes on him. Uh, here's one thing I want to talk to you about today. I'm working on something that uh, I did back in April. I did a little uh, retreat for some young adults in our church. Uh, it was fun. It was a, well, a Friday, Saturday, like Friday night, Saturday and Sunday deal. And uh, we talked about spiritual practices. We talked about, uh, and really what I had them do was practice spiritual practices. And I had this idea, well, wouldn't it be fun if we could do a spiritual practice retreat in a virtual setting? So instead of having to have people come out to Colorado or, or some other place, uh, what if we just did one over Zoom, you can be wherever you are. You can be at home. You can go to a hotel. You could go out to a cabin somewhere, whatever works for you. As long as you have Wi-Fi, you can hop on and we can do uh, Zoom and we could still have the conversations that I like to have, but then also have a little bit of free time, have some assignments, some different uh, practices to try, and then maybe learn learn a few things about uh, kind of work, what God's doing with you at the moment and where where uh, he would have you go to find life with him in the best way. If that's something that interests you, I'm going to do this in November and I don't have anything up on the website just yet, but if it's something that uh, interests you, let me know. I'd love to hear that. Uh, It's easy to get a hold of me. You just go to my website is ericnevins.com or you can just go to halfwaytherepodcast.com, hit that contact button, send me an email or um, you could, uh, hit me up on any social media on Twitter, on Facebook, uh, whatever. There's always the halfway there, uh, podcast page, uh, which you can find as well. So there's some ideas, something I'm working on. I'm wondering if anybody's interested in it. If that's you and you have a second, uh, when you're listening to this episode, let me know. I would love to hear. There'll be a small cost, um, but not a lot. So, okay, there's that. That's something I'm working on, hopefully, to do soon. Uh, Let's get into this episode. I just finished editing this thing. It is a real joy. I think you're going to enjoy it. In fact, I call it the Ambassadors of Joy, Laura Paget and Ambassadors of Joy. You'll you'll find out why that is significant, but she's had some really amazing mentors. Uh, She's learned a lot about herself and a lot about uh, honoring the Lord with her whole being, which we talk about, something I get really passionate about. So I'm glad we had the chance to talk about it. Um, And she became a writer, which is really interesting. So she's an author, a dancer, a public speaker, and every once in a while, she dresses up as an elf. So we talk about that. Uh, I think that you will enjoy it. So here's my conversation with Laura Paget. Laura, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> I just remembered that the uh, elf picture, the famous elf picture that you shared with me. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's one of my favorite gigs. That's great. How'd you get into that? Um, about probably, I think uh, nine years ago, a uh, person who was doing the organizing for the Golden City of Golden's Christmas came and said, I understand you're a dancer and wondered if you'd choreograph a song for for dancing elves. And she had brought some other women to me. We got costumes. We choreographed this dance. And we thought, honestly, Eric, 
we thought this was a one time <laughs> thing. We did it for the Golden Candlelight Walk up on a stage and uh, with Santa, and um, it was a hit. And so the elves have been in every Christmas parade. They've been up in Golden. Uh, they've been in, uh, we, we do Santa's breakfast. We do a lot of different things. But how it branched out, because I prayed to God. And in my book, there are a couple of stories about being an elf and saying, gosh, I, do, I don't want to take the sacred out of this. Um, and God has taken us to homeless shelters. He's taken us to uh, a place in Denver called Tennyson Center where the children are um, removed from their homes for one reason or another. He's taken us to churches. He's taken us to places where children are dying. Um, wow. And we've become ambassadors of joy. And I think if that isn't the work of Christmas and Christians, then I need to go back to school. <laughs> no doubt. Wow. So that, it's it's really a ministry now. Yeah. Very cool. Uh, well, that's a that's an interesting ministry, definitely unique, and it sounds like bringing a lot of joy, which I think is is a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. All right, ambassadors of joy. I like that one. That's good. Well, that was the original story I wrote about being in a homeless shelter and what I learned from a young man there who had his mom and his brother. And he had been on the streets for several years. And I was at a homeless shelter with the late Warren Howard, who was playing Santa that year. And um, I wrote and I called it Ambassadors of Joy. Um, And I sent it to Chicken Soup and they published it. But they published it under a different name called It's for Everyone, based on what the elf told the little child who asked, is Christmas really for me too? Mm. Um, Hard, but really rewarding work. Yeah. And I think, it's, and I believe it's the Lord's work. And I've said to him, you know, Lord, bless it or block it if it becomes something you no longer want us doing. And he blesses. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. I love that. Okay. So that's a really good kind of introduction to you and, mm-hmm. and who you are, I think. Um, so I love that and what you're doing. You mentioned that you, you wrote a book and I'm sure we'll get into that here as we go. Well, take us back a little bit and tell us about, uh, where are you from? Where did you grow up and what was your, what was the spiritual climate like when you were growing up? Oh, um, I'm a Denver native. Oh, great. There's not many of those. There's a lot of Californians and Midwesterners here. And we love you all, <laughs> um, you know, but I am a native. My husband is from Oklahoma, but he's been here 50 50- years. So we let him call himself almost a native, a a (laughs) semi-native. But um, so I grew up here uh, on the old north side and then moved to a place called Welby, which is uh, now it's Furniture Row. But in those days, it was farm country. We were not farmers. Um, And my father and my mother moved there to get us out of North Denver because of the crime rate at that time. Now, this is the 60s, early 60s. And unfortunately, I grew up in a home where spirituality was not discussed. Um, My father was of one persuasion, my mother of another. And uh, we just, they just decided that, you know, my dad did try to take us to his church and say, will my children be welcome? And they said no. Oh, wow. Yeah, my mom was divorced. And so that was a bad thing in those days. So uh, I didn't grow up with any kind of spirituality other than sitting out on the fence and watching (laughs) the clouds and saying, but there has to be somebody who loves us up there. And uh, yeah, so that was that. And I wasn't until it was, I was 26 when I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. So I went, you know, a fourth of my life. How old am I, Eric? Let's see. I'm 68. <laughs> okay. So 26 would have been a long, uh, quite a piece of my my life, not knowing him, not knowing God, not even understanding the Father's love for us. Yeah, but you said you you kind of knew that there was some must have been something out there. Tell us about that. Um, I just uh, first of all, let me say, and I don't want to denigrate my parents, but they were both alcoholics. So I spent a lot of time alone, sitting on fen- on the fence, trying not to fall off, and um, just talking to someone up there mm. that I said, you know, why 
is this happening? What is wrong with me? Uh, what is wrong with me that they drink and that they fight and hurt each other and us? And what is wrong with me? Um, and so I went a great deal of my life saying, what is wrong with me? And um, even after I met Jesus, I asked that question. Mm. What wasn't sure I could ever be accepted or included because children of alcoholics isolate. We isolate because, well, we can't bring people home, can we? And um, I don't want a pity pot because my work, we, when we talk about my books, my first book is about my conversion at 26 years old in Montrose, Colorado, and understanding that there was nothing wrong with me. And that my parents were ill, but, you know, and walking through lenses of forgiveness, which has been freeing for me. Um, yeah. And then I do a big ministry for families of, of children like me. Wow. Okay. So, so when you finally came to faith, how, how did that happen? Tell us that story. Um, I was surrounded by people in Montrose and. Um, How'd you get to Montrose? I ran away from Denver because I was 26 years old and my dad had been dead for 10 years. And, um, I just, I was done. I was done with, you know, dealing with the effects of what my mom was living. And, uh, and again, I don't want to denigrate her. She's a fabulous woman, beautiful, very talented, beautiful woman, just affected with the bad disease. And I, was looking at some trade magazines. I was an OR technician and first assistant, um, which I also talk about in my new book. And um, I, I was looking at some trade magazines. I, I got to get out of here, dude. And Montrose just seemed like the perfect place. So I went over there and interviewed. They loved me. But I was also recruited, <coughs> excuse me, by two of the physicians uh, that I had worked with, who I worked with at University of Colorado. Um, they were residents and they said, come on, we need, you know, highly trained people in this little town. And I was very highly trained in, in transplant and ortho and wow. eyeballs and things like that. So I went and, uh, and that's where I thought I was running away from whoever this character was that didn't want to protect me and my sisters and turned out I ran right into his arms. And <laughs> <laughs> one night I was, uh, I had several people who tried to witness to me and say, you know, have you heard about Jesus? I go, oh yeah, I heard all about this guy hanging on a cross for you all. Not, not anything to do with me. And uh, one night I got into it with one of these people. I mean, really a shouting match at my home and he walked out and left a Bible. And I picked it up in the middle of the night. I had a dream um, and oh, I wow. went out and I picked up the Bible and it, I really tell you this happened. It was years before I would share this with people because people thought I was nuts. Now they think I'm nuts for another reason, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm an elf. That's enough. But um, no doubt. I actually was in bed and felt um, I had gone to bed crying and screaming, literally screaming. Um, about this character up on the cross and this God. He didn't know anything about pain and rejection. What did he know? And I went to bed and had a dream and I had the worst pain in my wrists and my feet. And I woke up just sweating and crying and uh, got up and went around the house. And I too was becoming quite the drinker. So the first thing mm. I did was start to go to the refrigerator for a drink and ended up getting some water and sat down and my friend um, had marked in the Bible. Uh, he had marked a couple of different places, but I ended up in the book of John and I read until daylight. Um, I'm not a good reader. I wasn't then. I bombed out of college when I was a freshman because I could not read well. Um, and I thought, wow, okay. But I never let him, I still didn't let him in. We still walk several weeks with people trying to tell me about Jesus. And I, one morning I woke up and, and realized, yeah, this guy's for real. This is a real deal. So that was it. But it was a Damascus experience for me. It was a slap me back to the prom kind of thing. And some of us need that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, but what I love is that God is so faithful, right? To to even oh, give yeah. you a dream and to make you kind of feel like, you know, you this is to kind of awaken what was in you and just 
say? I mean, so did you have a sense of God being a father? Like, what was that like for you? Was that kind of, did you have to wrestle with that for a while? Or? Oh, brother, I still do <laughs> from time to time. Sure. <laughs> because although, let me explain, um, <clears throat> God has taken me through several doors of forgiveness, and my parents are dead, and people say, well, wow, well, wow, too late. It isn't. Um, mm. because forgiveness isn't for the offender forgiveness is for the offended and it we offer actually I just did a big podcast on this for some sisters of mine Jericho girls and talked about um, the ideas of forgiveness were to not wish harm on the offender forgive that you know, let go of the offense but not necessarily be in reunion in that relationship. Right. Um, so we talked about this because we're talking about abuse, which is hard to uh, talk about forgiveness and abuse because we get it all messed up. Yeah. And, uh, and, and that the forgiveness is to hand it back to God and say, I hurt. And then he begins his healing work, but he can't do it when I was so angry and so righteously indignant. Um, so my father was a World War II veteran with what we now call PTSD, but we didn't know that. Then. Yeah. Quite violent, uh, rager and all those things. But through the years, God has led me to see through the lens of compassion and, um, my mother as well, and and to see what mm. was going on with them. But gosh, I'm in my 60s, and I would say maybe in my 50s, I began to see it. Wow. And uh, so it was easier then for me to accept God as the loving father, because I didn't have the father that said, come sit on my knee. I'm really sorry that happened to you. It was just fuck it up, shut up, and get out of here. And so that kind of a father image doesn't really lend itself to a spiritual foundation where God is the father. Right. But he's worked with that a lot, and the forgiveness has helped tremendously. And I just wrote a piece on my blog called Some Gave All um, mm. about my father's sacrifice, his sacrifice to be a soldier in World War II and what it cost him and cost us. <laughs> right. Well, yeah, you're right. And what's interesting about that, the same thing happened with, with my father-in-law because he was in Vietnam, and he didn't, um, he didn't fight. He was a mechanic, but – he was still exposed to Agent Orange and other things that really ended up taking his life. And it's like we think of – it's one thing to be in the battle, right, or to be there, whatever happens. Oh, yeah. Happens. But those effects last a lifetime, sometimes regardless of whether you were in fighting or, or whatever whatever else happened. And we – it's that's hard to take into, into account, I think. Like you, it's hard to move on. So, yeah, interesting. It sounds like God was really tender with you. In in many ways, um, so you you finally give your life to Christ. What so you were in this apparently Christian community? What was that like? So how how did you kind of start to how did God start to shape you and change you in those first however whatever period of time uh, early on there? Well, he brought. Um, I would not go to church obviously for the experiences us kids had had with the church. And I didn't understand that those were rules made by men and women in a in an administrative sort of business way, and um, that children from divorce were just not recognized, mm. or children that you know products. Um, and so it took another goodness sake, at least another two or three months of a friend of mine that I worked with. Who kept saying he would kept saying stuff like, "Gosh, you really should try this church I've been going to." Like, oh no, no, no! I don't want nothing to do with them people. Uh, uh-uh, uh, no, no. And uh, finally, I, I, I went, and I met these two people there, Dolores and Trevor. <laughs> yeah, well, that's funny. But why, why, why did you go finally? Like, what, what led you to go? All right. My goodness, I tell you, um, I had two other friends. I'm trying to retrace this story. Uh, I had two other friends that were party mates. And see, I thought, well, you could deal with Christ and still do your Saturday night thing. Which, um, so, but when I went out with them one night, these two ladies, 
they um, said, boy, we sure do miss church. Oh, no. <laughs> said, I'm all about this Christ, dude, but don't be talking church. So they actually almost literally drugged me. <laughs> and I liked the church. And it was the same one my friend had um, gotcha. talked about. So that's how I got there. Yeah, yeah. But I was kicking and screaming. You know, I am that child, Eric, that learned no early and uses it frequently. <laughs> and I have one of those. <laughs> so, so God is like, all right. So, but he had to surround me literally. And I went to that church and I, and I met these two people who then began to walk me, um, began to walk me into the life of Christ. And he became a father figure. His name was Trevor. And Dolores is the subject of my first book of how she tenderly brought me along. I mean, she was 65 and I was 26 and she was this refined, retired, lifelong Christian lady. And I was a hellion <laughs> and uh, still uh, in many ways. But she took the job and God assigned her. And for 35 years, we walked together. Yeah, that book is called Dolores Like the River. It is. Yeah. Because it's set in, well, it's set in Mostert, Colorado, obviously. It's a month rose. But uh, she was a real cute little gal. But whenever somebody would misspell her name, she would say, no, I'm D-O-L-O-R-E-S, like the river in southern Colorado. So oh, that's gotcha. where the book got the name. Gotcha. Okay. And what she was in my life, Eric, God sent her to be that 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 nurturing um, river of yeah. life. Well, tell us a story. Give us an example of, of one way that she really nurtured you in faith. One night, I'm, I was, to, well, gosh, ooh, one. Okay, I'll, I'll pick this one. Okay. One night we were sitting and we were talking about um, Jesus. We were talking about his love for us. And uh, it was just her and I. And I can't remember exactly now how it all came down, but I asked her if she believed my father was in hell. And she said, why? And I told <laughs> her he always had his Bible and he would read it. But when we came in, he would close it because um, he was so ashamed of what had happened in his life um, that he was kicked out of his church and that we weren't welcome. And she told me that um, churches are full of people and people are full of flaws. And to walk within those communities, we must be gracious and forgiving. And that, no, she did not believe my father was in hell. And she said that God loves his children. And she believed the fact that he read his Bible and he tried to... I mean, he did live a violent life, but she said, nobody gets to make that call but Jesus mm. and to waste our time trying to say, this person's going to help. This person's going to help. You don't know what's going to happen, even on their deathbed. And I, people could take me on about that if they want. Yeah. I don't know. I've heard so many testimonies uh, about that, but that was one way. The other was when I divorced. So my first marriage, she had warned me. Mm. I don't know. You better think about it. But I so wanted to be married and have a family. Again, never having had that. Yeah. And uh, and that ended in divorce. And she was just there for every step of the way. There were people who judged me in that small town. Um, and we we were living in Denver now, but there were a lot of people who we had been friends with there and he was from Montrose and how she told me um, so many wonderful things that helped me to heal and uh, even though my my life was again shattered and broken um, she just walked me through that she also walked me into the rooms of recovery mm. she had not come from the family I had come from but she walked me into the rooms of recovery so that I could begin to heal from the wounds of the abuse and the alcoholism so I didn't become the abuser, <laughs> yeah. the alcoholic. So those guys, so there's three. Yeah. Uh, just, boy, I mean, the book is just full of them. And she never was preachy 
or turn or burn. She was just patient and kind and gentle. She was Jesus's hands and feet and heart. Yeah, that's lovely. Well, I love hearing stories like that because uh, one, I'm I'm sort of like you. Yeah, I always wish I had uh, mentors like that. You know, um, I did. I have had some good mentors, but um, I also recognize just how important those people who really are like Jesus and who love us mm-hmm. through all the thick and thin um, are to our lives. And we really have to um, like, so I don't know for our friends listening or friends, maybe you have somebody like that and maybe you don't. And if you don't ask God for one, you know, and, and pray and search and uh, cause you cannot overestimate the, the significance of um, a mentor like that. And I mentor people now. Yeah. I mentor people in dance. Um, I teach sacred dance. I mentor a young writer that I adore. Um, I, I mentored lots of people. So also people have said to me, well, how do I get to be a mentor? Well, you don't just take a class and sign up. Right. You, um, you pray and you wait for opportunity and ask God again for that. And be patient because he has the right person, whether you're the mentor or the mentee. Yeah, that was a great uh, story about Dolores. So she she mentored you. So you obviously went through uh, some painful times with with uh, marriage and divorce. And is that uh, – so did you have a time when you felt like – was that a period when you felt like you were in the dark night of the soul? Or was there kind of other periods of your life that you had to walk through and, and, and Jesus used to kind of take, take some things out of you? Uh, yes. Yeah, that was a dark <laughs> time. Yeah, sounds like it. Um, and it was a custody battle for my uh, then three-year-old son. And so that was just horrible. Um, but there have been so many times. I think the dance ministry has been very hard. Uh, I, I really appreciate when people say, no, we don't want that art in this community. And I can understand that. Um, But I always knew in my heart that God wanted me dancing and Mm. for him. And he took me uh, kind of funny, took me downtown in Denver. Anybody who's listening out there, who's been a dancer in Denver knows the name of Miss Gwen Bowen. And I went down there and took tap dance classes from her. And I asked her one day, I noticed she had a cross on, and I said, boy, I'd love to learn to dance for Jesus. And she sent me to Boulder to a lady named Cheryl Yeruso, and I began to dance with that team up in Boulder. And to I was mentored under her and also Paula Douthat, the late Paula Douthat, who had danced everywhere from uh, Denver to the Vatican. Wow. I did not go with Paula on that trip, but uh, who so believed that dance, beautiful, modest movement, the Lord was praising him. And so, but it took me a long time of rejection within my own church at the time. And so I found other ways to, God said other ways to those lights. And now... I dance in my church. I teach people. We just did a production at Lent that was, <coughs> excuse me, really fun. Well, okay. So I want to go into that because I think it's important. So okay. t- tell us, uh, first of all, why dance? Like where did that come from for you? Mm-hmm. And then um, and I'll have some other questions. I'm Celtic. <laughs> okay. My mother, my mother was a Scot. Uh, She was Scottish and Irish, actually. Uh, So my parents were ballroom dancers, weren't they? So they, here at Elitch is the old Trocadero, they were competitive ballroom dancers, as was my Aunt Fern, who was another mentor in my life. I talk about her, too. And um, I just, from being a little kid, I would just dance. I would just move. And my mother used to say, oh, child, you have St. Vitus dance, which was a nervous condition, (laughs) (laughs) which it's not funny. I don't know what they call it now. But anyway, uh, just always constantly danced and um, never had money for dance classes, never took a dance class till I was in my 40s. Okay. Um, Any kind of dance. But certainly dancing for the Lord was always a priority for me. And I, I was trained to do that. And now... I do that a lot. 
just taught a class yesterday to some kids um, here in Denver. And they, when people hear you can do Irish dance, you can teach Irish dance, which I did for years. They, uh, oh, Irish, we want Irish. Mm-hmm. But it's a, I also want to do praise and worship with these kids. So I found uh, the original Irish version of Robin Mark in Belfast. Who, wow. um, was who's the uh, author of Days of Elijah, and it was a beautiful rendition with the flutes and the pipes and all of it. And so I took it to these kids and I taught them uh, a praise dance wow. <laughs> to Days of Elijah. But I would say that in answer to your question, it's just always been there for me. Like a lot of yeah. people say, oh, I always want to be a writer. I didn't necessarily want to be a dancer. I just always wanted to dance and I do and I still am. So. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. So, well, that's important. And then, so you've been learning to kind of do that in your church. Cause I think a lot of, it can feel weird, right? I think a lot of Christians think that maybe it's, it's dancing is weird. And I think that has to do with our disconnection from our bodies. A lot of evangelicals are closet Gnostics. Gnosticism was a heresy in the second century that was, basically said the spiritual is good and the physical is bad. And so we, we have, we inherited a lot of that from the reformation and the, the enlightenment, but um, that, so that, but that's why I think it's important to talk about dance and how we can praise God with our bodies. I mean, David, when he danced before the Lord, right. And his wife was like, Hey, you can't do that. And he's like, whatever, I'm taking my shirt off now, you know? And, uh, <laughs> <told> <laughs> right. Fine. Take our clothes off. We try to- <laughs> right. Right. That's good. That's a different kind of dancing. <laughs> I didn't mean to. Yeah. No, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> but that's why it makes us nervous. Right. So that's where, but, but I think it's important to engage God with our body. So what are some things that you find when you, when you're able to do that or when you're teaching people that, helps them um, praise the Lord in a new way or connect to themselves in a new way that, that we should know about? It's firstly, it's not about me. Mm -hmm. Um, Nobody is judging me. So I always tell everyone at the beginning of my class, um, whether they're children or adults, that our pictures are all on God's refrigerator. Yeah, we are all on point. If I'm talking dance, we are all champions. <laughs> but the secular world has made it so about our bodies and how we look and our age. You know, this gray hair, and God doesn't ever do that. God says, "Come and dance with me, child." I just wrote again another piece on my blog called "Little Drummer Girl." And it was about taking my gifts to the church and having them say, no, 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 that's not good enough. And God continued to say, you come just like in the mythical song. Okay. It's not true, but you could almost imagine the little baby Jesus being pleased with the kid who brought all he had. Yeah. His little drum. And that's, that's how I feel about it. And I tell people in our world, we have been so exactly what you just said. We've been so trained that our bodies are bad and they're not. They are as much of a creation of God as our minds or anything else. And, and to offer that to him fully, 100% without uh, restriction and reservation, to me, that for me, it has been a more whole experience of offering to God. When I teach a praise dance, I teach simplicity and I teach movements that will express, you know, our praise to him, our praise and our prayer. And I've danced everywhere from California to Ottawa. And I have to tell you, I've danced with women who had just lost children mm danced our pain. I've danced with people who get ready to get married, danced our joy, danced our brokenness, women who have been hurt and abused, um, men who have come forward and danced just just to tell a story like we did here at my church in, in April. And we told the story of what it might have been like to be in the first 
Palm Sunday. Hmm. And the name of it was, Who is this guy? And the, the men who came forth in the church and danced and said, I'm not going to dance. But boy, they were the Holy Spirit. Hmm. When he gets a hold of you, it's like you don't have a choice and you don't, the whole self consciousness goes away. And that wouldn't it be nice if we could all not be so self conscious all the time that we're not willing to take a risk. But I also want to say, I honor people who do not want to dance in church. I honor people who do not want to dance, period. So I always call my work sacred movement. <laughs> dance. Yeah. And it freaks people out. So, yeah. Does that answer your question? It, it does. It opens the gate. Yeah. It's like the final frontier of surrender. Ooh, that's well put. Yeah, the final frontier of surrender, because it involves our body and how we look, right? And it's it's sort of that release of okay, I don't care what anybody thinks. I'm going to praise God and I'm going to be with there Him. A hundred percent holy and all in. Yeah. Itself. Yeah. Not saying that people who don't are not doing that. My husband wouldn't take dance step. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He danced once that I know of that was with me at a wedding. And basically he was so uncomfortable and I would never ask him to do it again. Uh, it was just happened to be his son's wedding. So um, it's hard, I think, to break down the walls of what the world tells us we're not. And the world tells us we're not uh, attractive men and women, tells us we're not worthy, tells us we're not thin enough, we're not off enough, we're not this, we're not that. And so we have a whole plethora of knots. Yeah. And I think that's what restricts us. And, you know, here's another thing. Think about what you're telling your body every day. I often give uh, speeches to women. I speak at women's conferences. And I say, ladies, please stop with the retro reach. I'm going back here to be 30. Yeah. No, you're not. Yes. And the thing about, I just love something Helen Murray put up today on Facebook, but I, I'm not going to repeat it because it does have a bad word. Mm -hmm. But basically she said, I don't care that I'm getting older. Yeah. And um, it's better than the alternative, right? <laughs> like, how well, is... <laughs> And, you know, what an ungrateful thing to say. Right. My body's not good enough anymore because gravity's become my enemy. I don't can't sleep through the whole night because I have other issues I have to care for. Right. I, I have all these wrinkles in this gray hair. What an ungrateful thing to say. And the same thing, I think, in the situation of my body's not good enough to present to God. How ungrateful. Right. And then think from a physiological standpoint. If you're constantly feeding your body the message of unacceptance. And then you end up not well. Right. Not, well, yeah. I'm not saying people who get sick have done that. I'm just saying it, there is a connection between what we tell ourselves and how we feel. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm. Even even if it's only psychologically unwell. I mean, you you are unwell. And uh, absolutely. Yeah, I agree with that. Interesting. So I was, you're just sparking all kinds of thoughts in me. I love it. And it's making me, <laughs> making me go down some, some roads. I think it's so true. We've got to have a holistic understanding of the human being. Um, as, a as, as believers, it's, it's darn near criminal that we don't because we, if, if God is all about the restoration of all things, he's given us bodies. Jesus took a body and we'll live in one forever. That's an interesting point, right? God himself will live in a human body forever that will never change so um that that right there just dignifies everything everything about being being a human being including having a body so i love the way that dance kind of brings that out in you so was this for you like discovering it or kind of stepping into to dance was this like a um acceptance of and kind of a further furthering of your self in the lord yes yeah yes. Because I knew that, you know, you go to churches, you hear beautiful singers. We have fabulous musicians mm -hmm. at our church. We have an incredible choir. And, and you say, oh, my little gift isn't okay. And God says, your <laughs> gift is okay. And we're going to use that. Um, and so it was a validation to me that God does not give unusable gifts. Yeah. And he does not use us 
all in the same way. The scripture that talks about the eyes and the feet and the tongue and all the different things that he's put together. And um, yes, it was a validation that I'm not crazy. I'm not, um, there's not something wrong with me. Again, that message. Um, I, I'm who he meant me to be. And I'm a little dancing spirit. Whether I'm an elf or I'm on the altar or I'm, I'm uh, praising him with Irish dance. Um, and I'm teaching people again, the arts belong to God. Yeah. They are Amen. not ours. They are not ours. And I tell people, whether you write, whether you dance, whether you sing, whatever you do, this is a gift that's been given and it is valid in his eyes. And um, he will take the places where it needs to be. He will minister. I have a, another story about called at the foot of the cross. Um, and in that story, uh, it's in my book, and it says, I, I got to the point where I'd had so much headache from people who did not want to see the dance in church. And we'd been dancing in this Lutheran church in Golden. And I just... I was tired, Eric. I was tired of the barbs. I was tired of the insults. I was tired of the, this has no place, blah, blah, blah. Okay, bye. I'm out of here. But the worship director called me. He said, Laura, I, I would like for you to dance. Um, let's see, what was Ash Wednesday? Oh, dude. And we'd already done this dance once before, but I said, all right. So I went and got my friend uh, who did the dance with me. And it's about, I act out, dropping every burden at the foot of the cross. And um, then she comes and she's in white and she wraps me and puts oil on me and we mm. go off. It's called at the foot of the cross. I'm laying every burden down. And I, I my heart wasn't in it, Eric. And I said, ah, oh, brother. So um, through the forum. One of my knees started hurting. The costumes went missing. I couldn't get rehearsals together. So I called the director and I said, let me just take a pass here on this one. And he said, okay. And that night or two nights before the actual Ash Wednesday, God gave me dream. And mm. he said, you get up and you dance because there's someone that needs it. This isn't about you. Wow. One of my very first lessons of, guess what? You're not the queen of the universe. And if you were, you should be ashamed. Look how it's turning out. <laughs> and uh, he said, get, get off your pity pot and wrap your knee. You know, you are the queen of Advil and Epsom salt. You know how to take care of that knee. And you guys get together and you put this together. I called the director and I said, okay, I guess we're supposed to do it. And he said, good. When we did that dance that night, it was right before communion. And when I went back to my seat, there were two women who went to communion. And this one young woman, Eric, fell face down. Wow. And began to sob. Now, I don't know what her trouble was. I've never seen her. I hadn't seen her before. I haven't never seen her since. But when we left that night in silence, I turned and I looked back at her and she said, thank you. Thank you. Wow. Yeah, there's there's power there. There's power, and that, and that, and to be used that way is not going to happen if I'm so dumb, God worried about whatever. Yeah, gonna... yeah, and I don't, <clears throat> friends. I mean, what's your gift? What's your gift? What is it that God's asking you to do? What is it that you yeah. know that you've been trying to run from? Uh -huh. You know, God has been asking you to do, yeah. and you just need to get over the fear and do it afraid, and go and do it anyway. And how might it you bless people? It. What if God wants to use you? Because I think he does. That's See, that's what I think. I think he does. I think what you experienced is exactly mm -hmm. what God wants to do. And he was kind enough to give you a dream to help you step into it. But friends, you don't need a dream. You just need to hear this, right? God's calling you. You know what it is. Go do it. Go do that's it. where I write my stories. Because mm. I know there are people out there, whether it's on my blog or it's in my books. That's why I do speaking engagements. And I say, oh, my goodness. Yeah. Now, if you miss this opportunity, he will find a way to minister to that other person. But the blessing that will be missed to you is that you said no. Right. Said, no. God said, oh, all right. Because we do not have a God that says, well, I'm going to force you to do that. Right. He gives us the choice. Yeah. Even if he has to 
put you inside of a whale or something. <laughs> so thank you for sharing that story. I want to talk a little bit more because you got into writing eventually. And like, <laughs> how, how did that happen? Yeah. Uh, so I, re- I was at Regis University. I was were you, really were you teaching? What's that? Were you teaching? Well, yes, I taught dance. Okay, great. And um, actually, I took my BA there because I needed to go back. I needed to find a different way to work. Um, I was a medical transcriptionist, and my work went offshore. So I had to go back to school. So I went back to school. I did not have my BA. I was 50 years old when I got my bachelor's. And then I went to work for Regis. And uh, this is the beautiful thing about this story. And while I was there, people said, oh, you're an Irish dancer. Well, teach us Irish dance. So I started teaching a lovely class of Irish dance there. And then I decided I'd really like my master's. Now, please remember, I, I'm a child who, who, when I went to college in 1969, I read at the sixth grade level. Wow. And so I flunked out. <laughs> but now I had my BA, thanks to Jesus, who had found ways for me to get this. And my master's degree was free because I worked there. Oh, nice. And I said, I want to do a master's in dance. Well, we don't have a dance program. Oh, well, okay. So I prayed and Dolores and I worked through this. And she said, you know, you've always been a good writer. Is there any way to incorporate dance in writing? Hmm. Maybe not, but there was a way to incorporate storytelling through movement. And I had been doing that for years in my church. So I took a master's degree in storytelling through movement. Mm. During that, I had to take writing classes, novel building, character, all of these things, which ended up giving me this master's degree with these classes in writing. And when I retired at 59 years old, a friend of mine said, why don't you write a blog? I was talking in Bible, so I was always telling stories. She said, these should be on your blog. And at that time, Dolores passed away, and I was devastated. I guess being 101 years old, <laughs> I was <laughs> like, wait a minute. I'm not done yet. Oh, man. But, but she was, and God took her home. So I wrote on my blog several stories to help me heal. Um about losing her. And someone said, oh, Laura, this needs to be a book. And I looked at her like, right. And at the same time, I um, joined a, another writer's group. And a friend of mine said, why don't you turn something like that into a contest? But I didn't want to part with the Laura show. It was too precious. It was too tender. So I wrote a story about something, again, Dolores helped me to do. And that was to walk into forgiveness with my mother um, years after her death by receiving her ring, having it restored and wearing it. It was my forgiveness of my mama. Mm. Bales of death. It's called Mama's Ring. It was an award winner. It was published by Zulon Press. And I went, oh, boy, dude. And from there, I knew Mm. God wanted me to. Um, and then I wrote the book about Dolores. I put some of those stories and added others. And that became my first book since wow. then. He has just, you know, um, I always say to him, God, I'm old, I'm tired, and I'm retired. And I don't want to work. <laughs> <laughs> Writing is work. No and doubt. He, Ew. And he says, oh, you want to talk about old? Let's have a talk about that. <laughs> so we, we have a good laugh about that, you know, the ancient one. Yeah. And uh, that's how that happened. And so when I wrote Dolores Like the River, it was cathartic. Um, but it was also a testimony to what God can do with the most broken of us. Yeah. And um, it's gone into the recovery community, communities. I talked to a lot of people about how God... Um, help me into recovery by giving me a mentor. And uh, yeah, mm. so that's, that's it. And then Jesus and shorts came along four years later. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to ask about that one because I, that, I love that. Uh, just that title. That's such a great yeah. idea. Jesus and shorts. How'd you come up with that? And where, where'd that come from? Well, that again was God saying, um, this is the way I want you to do your writing. And I began to submit short stories to chicken soup. Mm-hmm. And they took two of them. I have a third one up now. I'm hoping they'll take. And several were award winners. 
But I, I loved writing Dolores in some ways. In other ways, it was really hard to go back through some of that. But I'm a short story writer. I like short stories for me. Beginning, middle, and boom, 2,000 words or 2,500. Yeah. And so I thought, you know, what if I put together a collection of short stories? And I say, you know, we don't have to always see Jesus in long <clears throat> stories. Most of the Bible stories are short stories. Yeah. And so that, that's it. Jesus in shorts. They're short stories. 25 short stories of life-changing Jesus moments. And that was his idea. And then I have a wonderful writing mentor, uh, Patricia Raybach. And she loved the title from the get-go. She wrote uh, the lead endorsement for it. And she's quite the lovely lady and um so yeah and now jesus and shorts is winning awards oh very cool um, yeah he's it, the book has won two major awards it's up for a third with writer's digest and many of the stories in it eric have won awards and have been published and people have given me permission now to republish because this work is to help people see him in every little way in every little day yeah in every little life and they're just little short stories, so you can read them. And some are hysterical, uh, like finding my temper in the airport. <laughs> Not going into that right now, but how Jesus <laughs> shut my mouth. Hallelujah. And um, I love it. A yeah. fishing story of almost losing my life in the Eagle River, and Jesus brought my ballet training back to me to stay afloat. But, um, you know, and some are sad. Some are about my life in the operating room. Some are about... Um, they're just the Jesus is in all the moments, isn't he? He isn't just in the joy, is he? Yeah. Amen. That's where amen. that came from. <laughs> I love that. No, actually, I, I think that's a great place to kind of just wrap up. And so, friends, you can get um, Jesus in Shorts and Dolores Like the River. Uh, I've got links to those both at the show notes at halfwaytherepodcast.com as well as Laura's website if you want to connect with her. <laughs> connect with me. Laura, thanks so much for being here. I appreciate you sharing some of your story and uh, you, man, you've had some great mentors and some great moments. And um, I just love what I've learned about the Lord uh, through you today. So thanks. And thank you for the opportunity and to your listeners. I just want to say bless you. You're so welcome. Anything you want to leave us with? I just want to, right now I'm going through kind of a tough time with another family member and um I, I kind of fell down in my faith this week and, and, and God picked me back up and he said, let's go. It's okay. Mm. And I said, no, I'm done. I, I'm not with Jesus. Oh, no, I'm not going to make that mistake. But I said, you know what? I'm throwing in the towel on this. And he said, no, you're not. Get up. Mm. I'm back in the ring. I'm with you. I'm in your corner. Bah, he's but in your you're corner. In a bad place. It's okay. We have a, and if you fall down like I did, and I fall more than I fly all the time, um, we have a subscription lifetime to humanity. <laughs> and we accept that. If wow. We, were, we wouldn't need him. That's, there you go. that's perfect. Thank you, Laura. I appreciate it. I appreciate you.